Dear aspirants, this is an important announcement. The much awaited results of Mains Scholarship Test 2020 will be declared by tomorrow, that is on 8th August at 6 pm. And before that, we wish to hear your experience and suggestions for further improvement. So to give your feedback, access the link for the feedback form, which is given in the description box as well as in the comment section. We request all the participants of the scholarship test to submit their feedback form. Let's begin with the first news article analysis. These news articles are with reference to bi-monthly monetary policy statement 2020-21. The policy statement was published yesterday that is on 6th August 2020 by the Reserve Bank of India after the three-day meeting of the Monetary Policy Committee. So in this context, let us discuss about monetary policy, then how RBA qualitatively controls credit flow to handle inflation and also major announce mentioned in these news articles. The syllabus relevant to the analysis of these news articles is highlighted here for your reference. Now, we will see about monetary policy which refers to the use of monetary instruments under the control of RBI to regulate interest rates, money supply and also availability of credit to achieve the ultimate objective of economic policy. Here the primary objective of monetary policy is to maintain price stability while keeping in mind the objective of growth rates. So, as per the RBI Act of 1934, the Reserve Bank of India is vested with the responsibility of conducting monetary policy. Here RBI states that price stability is a necessary precondition to sustain the growth rates. See the monetary policy framework aims at setting the policy rates. These rates will be set up based on an assessment of the current situation and also considering the evolving macroeconomic situation. Then it aims at modulation of liquidity conditions to coordinate money market rates at the repo rate or around the repo rate. Here when you say money market rates, it refers to interest rate for various money market instruments. And the announced repo rate changes transmit through the money market to the entire financial system. And this in turn influences aggregate demand, which is a key determinant of inflation and growth rates. Now, we will see two methods of credit control by the Reserve Bank of India. These are quantitative or general credit control policy and qualitative or selective credit control policy. The instruments that are available under quantitative or general credit control policy or bank rate can reserve ratio, statutory liquidity ratio, repo and reverse repo rates, then marginal standing facility and conduct of open market operations. Then under the qualitative or selective credit control policy, RBA may impose a ceiling on credit. That is, it will restrict the lending capacity of banks to grant loans against specific securities. Then it may impose margin requirements. Here know that a margin means the proportion of the value of security against which loan is not given. Margin against a particular security is reduced in order to increase credit flow to a particular sector. And also know that it is increased to decrease credit flow. Then one more qualitative method is through discriminatory interest rates. Here RBA makes credit flow to certain priority or weak sections by charging concessional rates of interest. Then RBA may give directives regarding the purposes for which which loans may or may not be given. Then one severe and uh, rare action is direct action of uh, RBI for banks that are failing to comply with the directives given by the Reserve Bank of India. Here RBI issues periodical letters to banks to exercise control over credit in general or to exercise control over advances against particular commodities. So these are certain ways in which RBI qualitatively control the flow of credit. Now let us come to the recent announcements made by the Reserve Bank of India. In the news article reports that Reserve Bank of India has not altered the policy repo rate. Here know that a repo rate is the rate at which banks borrow money from the RBI by selling securities to the Reserve Bank of India. There will be an agreement to repurchase the sold securities on a mutually agreed future date at an agreed price. So when this repo rate is reduced, the obligation from the banks is to reduce the interest rates for the loans. That is the banks will extend the same gesture shown by the Reserve Bank of India to its customers. And this is what is referred to monetary transmission in one of the news articles. Then one reason why Reserve Bank of India has not changed the repo rate is because of the expectation that the good monsoon and bumper curry crop will help in bringing down the inflation in the food prices. 
The news article also states that the central bank did not extend the moratorium on loan repayments that were offered to borrowers until 31st August. However, it has allowed banks to restructure loans from large corporates, MSMEs and also from individuals. And this is to help these entities to help overcome and manage the growing stress on their incomes and balance sheets. So, when we say restructuring of loans, here the banks may give the option of concessional interest rates for the already obtained loans. So, these restructuring efforts may or may not include a moratorium on installed repayments. So, such restructuring is helpful for those entities that are facing financial challenges. And it also helps these entities to avoid bankruptcy and at the same time for the bank, the borrowed money will be paid back in some time. So, in the context of this news articles we have discussed about monetary policy then how RBA qualitatively controls credit flow to handle inflation and certain announcements made by the Reserve Bank of India. Let's move on to the next news article analysis. This opaid article enumerates the concerns regarding the new education policy 2020. The syllabus relevant to the analysis of this news article is highlighted here for your reference. Now, know that the policy seeks to align itself with the sustainable development goal number four of ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education for all. And India aims to transform the present education system based on new education policy by 2040 with equitable access to the highest quality education for all learners regardless of their social or economic background. So, in this context, we are going to discuss some of the important concerns raised by the authors of this article. And the first concern raised is regarding expanding the scope of Right to Education Act in order to cover children from 3 years to 18 years and it is to achieve universalization of education. And know that this was proposed in the draft National Education Policy 2019 which aimed to include early childhood care education as an integral part of Right to Education Act. But the present policy is silent on this proposal. So, authors feel that only if Right to Education Act scope is expanded, then universal education can be attained. Then the next concern is that uh, since there is a clubbing of three A's of early childhood care education with grade 1 and grade 2 of a primary school, the authors feel that the Anganwadi workers who take care of preschool are professionally trained to be a teacher for primary classes. See, the policy envisages uh, training the current Anganwadi workers through a systematic effort according to the curricular or pedagogical framework developed by the NCERT. So, because of this, one of the authors criticizes that the government is trying to abandon its responsibility of even providing a good professional teacher for the earliest years. Here you should note that Anganwadi workers play a crucial role in the early years of children's life. This is because they are actually replacing the parents of the children in the institution. So, keeping this point in mind, another author supports that it is alright to begin teaching the children through the Anganwadi workers. Then the next concern is that the policy advocates philanthropic private participation. See, primarily policies focus is ensuring very high quality government education because it is the only way to make sure that every child is given access to education irrespective of where they are and how many children are there. And this cannot be ensured in a private sector because it is very unlikely that the private sector is going to open schools in remote areas with less than 10 children. And this can be provided only by the government. So, strengthening the government education system is important. But it does not mean that uh, private education should not be allowed because in the last 25 years, there is nearly 50% private school education and nearly 70% of enrollment in higher education is in private schools. But the problem is that there are too many players who are not of good quality. So, government should ensure to allow only those who are providing good quality education. Now, we will discuss our next concern is on the proposal to create school complexes. Know that the concept of a school complex was recommended by the Kotari Commission report on education and national development. This commission recommended a school complex to have a collaborative synergy between high or higher secondary schools and the smaller neighborhood and primary schools. Now, the new education policy 2020 provides for the establishment of a grouping structure called the school complex which will consist of one secondary school together with all other schools that offer low 
lower grades in its neighborhood in a radius of 5 to 10 kilometers and it will also include anganwadi institutions know that the aim of a school complex will be greater resource efficiency resource sharing and more effective functioning and management of schools but here authors worry that new education policy uses the word school complex in a completely different sense that of kotari commission because new education policy says we should have larger institutions indirectly meaning more number of students so under the name of a grouping they fear that the schools might be closed saying that small schools are sub optimal and they fear based on the maharashtra example where large number of schools were closed in the name of consolidation and the schools that existed in the proximity of the child within the community and providing access to education were either closed or merged here important point is even if the schools are small but they provide access to children in need and it should not be disturbed other than for enhancing quality of education so here the concern is that the larger institutions concept will remove access to education in rural and disadvantaged areas as it may lead to closing or merging of schools then the next concern is that uh, new education policy advocates equitable and inclusive education but there is no mention of a common school curriculum so there are worries that it would broaden inequalities in the society he know that the policy aims to impart education in the mother tongue or home language but authors feel that uh, this objective is open ended for example to understand this let us take uh, karnataka where kannada will be taught in schools of karnataka under this policy but this ignores the fact that uh, the areas of karnataka which share borders with the maharashtra and telangana prominently speak marathi and telugu respectively so if all of karnataka is taught in kannada ignoring this fact then young children who only understand their mother tongue will not be able to grasp the trivial facts then the next scenario is that it is possible for a school in a certain community to teach students in the dominant language of that area but here problem is that state governments transfer teachers so if a teacher who speaks kannada only is high to a school in the maharashtra border of karnataka then they will be taught in kannada which is obviously an unfamiliar language for the young minds so because of this students will not be able to attain foundational literacy and numeracy so here the possible solution is to make the state governments to allow local schools to teach in their own language by hiring local teachers then the next concern is about vocational education here the concern is that the push on vocational education will weaken students academically and it may lead to sustaining hereditary occupations and may lead to early exits or dropouts here the authors feel that uh, the notion of vocational education is only to prepare for vocations and should not be pushed early in the schools and if this is done then there will be a lot of dropping out of school and it will divert the focus only on vocational courses or open school because the ultimate objective will be job but not the education now we'll discuss final and important concern that is whether new education policies broad categorization of socio economically disadvantaged group hampers equity see according to the policy the sc disease can be broadly categorized based on gender identities socio cultural identities geographical identities disabilities then based on socio economic conditions the authors agree that it hampers equity because the disadvantaged groups are disadvantaged due to the historical backwardness caused to them by caste and religious inequalities now this broad categorization seems to remove the special importance given to these groups so as a conclusion authors hope that the new education policy will understand diverse social realities and diverse uh, disadvantages and exclusions in the society and it will try to retain the special treatment with this information let's move on to the next news article analysis This news article reports the ongoing tussle between Punjab and Madhya Pradesh chief ministers on the issue of giving GI tag for the basmati rice. So in this context we are going to discuss about geographical indication which is an indication used on products that have a specific geographical origin and such products happen to possess qualities or a repetition that are due to the source of origin. Know that a geographical indication tag also conveys an assurance of quality and a distinctiveness which is essentially a attributable to its source of origin in that defined geographical locality the tag is used to identify agricultural or natural
natural or manufactured goods. So if your product gets a GI tag, only such products that are produced in the geographical area can bear the GI tag. So in this context, know that the Paris Convention for the Protection of Industrial Property, which was signed in the year 1883, says that the geographical indications are covered as an element of intellectual property rights. And they are also covered under the trade related aspects of intellectual property rights that is TRIPS agreement of WTO. So, India after becoming a member of this TRIPS agreement, it has enacted the geographical indications of Goods Registration and Protection Act of 1999. This act came into enforcement in the year 2003, which seeks to provide for the registration and better protection of geographical indications. In India, J tags are issued or recognized by Office of the Controller General of Patents, Designs and Trademarks. And this office comes under the Department for Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade in the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. And know that the registration of a GA tag is valid for a period of 10 years, but it can be renewed from time to time for a further period of 10 years each. So with this information, let's come to the present issue. That is the Basmati rice variety received GA tag under the agricultural category in the year 2015-16. In India, this tag extends to the states of Punjab, Haryana, National Capital Territory, Uttarakhand, Uttar Pradesh and the erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir. See, in the year 2017-18, the Registrar of uh, Geographical Indications rejected the demand of the Madhya Pradesh government to get GA tag for its Basmati rice. So, in the later days, the Madhya Pradesh government filed a petition in the Madras High Court seeking GA tag for its Basmati rice. And this petition was rejected by the Madras High Court. So, the present Madhya Pradesh government is claiming that 13 of its districts are producing and exporting Basmati rice. Therefore, it should also be included in the GA tag for its Basmati rice. And we know that a GA tag for Basmati rice has been given on the basis of the traditionally grown areas of Basmati due to its special aroma, its quality and taste of the grain. So these qualities are indigenous to the region below the foothills of Himalayas in the Indo-Gangetic Plains. So the Chief Minister of Punjab said that Madhya Pradesh does not fall under this specialized zone for Basmati cultivation. Therefore, it cannot be given GA tag for its Basmati rice. With this information, the display practice question will be discussed at the end of the session. Let's move on to the next news article analysis. Now, let's take up this news article, which is about the review of priority sector lending guidelines as announced by the RBA governor. So, in this context, we are going to discuss about priority sector lending program. Know that the objective of PSL program is to ensure that adequate credit flows into the vulnerable sectors of the economy. And we know that uh, these sectors are not attractive for the banks from the view of profitability. So it is hailed as a significant reform in the banking sector as it ensures inclusive credit facility to the disadvantaged sectors of the economy. So Reserve Bank of India in exercise of its powers as per the Banking Regulation Act of 1949 issued PSL targets and classification directions 2016. And as per these guidelines, banks have to channelize part of their credit to the sectors that come under the priority sector lending categories. So, as on December 2019, these directions apply to every scheduled commercial bank that is licensed to operate in India by the Reserve Bank of India. Know that it is not applicable to regional rural banks and small finance banks. So, at present, there are eight categories which are called as priority sectors. These are agriculture, MSMEs, export credit, education, then housing and social infrastructure and also renewable energy and the last category is others. Under others category, loans are provided to individuals and their self-help groups or joint liability groups. Here, the individual borrower's household annual income should not exceed a specified amount by the Reserve Bank of India. This is to channelize money to low-income households and uh, distressed persons other than farmers. Then loans are sanctioned to state-sponsored organizations for scheduled caste or scheduled tribes for the specific purpose of a purchase and supply of inputs and for the marketing of the outputs of the beneficiaries of these organizations. In addition to these categories, the directions issued by the Reserve Bank of India also prescribe targets to be assured by the banks under priority sector lending program. 
these are certain targets and uh, sub targets listed here for your reference here you can notice that some leniency is given to foreign banks with less than 20 branches as compared to the other banks in terms of achieving and adhering the targets so with this information let's take up the news article the news article reports that uh, reserve bank of india has reviewed the existing guidelines related to the priority sector lending program and it has sought to address the regional disparities in flow of credit and also to bring startups as another category or beneficiary under the PSL program in order to increase their access to credit facility. So, Reserve Bank of India has stated that PSL status is being given to the startups. So, in the context of this news article, we have discussed about PSL program and the display practice question will be discussed at the end of the session. Let us move on to the next news article analysis. Now let's take up this news article which reports the state of Tamil Nadu registers a higher growth rate for the third consecutive year. So in this context uh, we are going to compare the national growth rates with the state of Tamil Nadu growth rates. The syllabus relevant to the analysis of this news article is highlighted here for your reference. Now before going to discuss this news article we should know the difference between gross domestic product and gross state domestic product. Know that uh, gross domestic product that is GDP is the final value of uh, goods and services produced within the geographical boundaries of a country during a specified period of time and this time period is generally taken as one financial year. Similarly, gross state domestic product that is GSDP indicates the final value of all goods and services produced within the geographical boundaries of a given state. Now, let us know in brief about the economy of Tamil Nadu. See, Tamil Nadu is the state with the largest number of factories in India and its capital city Chennai is the largest industrial and commercial center of South India. And we know that uh, Chennai is known as the Detroit of India due to the presence of large number of automobile industries. And know that almost one third of India's automobile manufacturing industry is concentrated here. Coming to the news article, it says that uh, for the third consecutive year, Tamil Nadu registered a higher economic growth rate than the national average rate. Tamil Nadu growth rate was about 8.59% in the financial year 2017-18 when the national average growth was about 7%. Similarly, in the year 2019-20, national growth rate is about 4.2% while the Tamil Nadu has a growth rate of 8.03% and it is almost double the growth rate of national average. The article says that the given calculations on the GSDP have been done at a constant prices with 2011-12 as the base year and we know that the growth calculated in constant price indicates the growth with respect to a base year and the calculation of GDP in constant prices is known as real GDP and GDP in terms of current prices is known as nominal GDP. And know that a real GDP removes the impact of price fluctuations. So, from the news article, we can say that uh, all the three sectors, that is primary, secondary and tertiary sectors, have performed well in the state of Tamil Nadu during the year 2019-20 as compared to the national statistics. Here note that uh, as per the economic survey 2019-20, the growth rate of agriculture sector at national level has been fluctuating and it is actually decreased from 6.3% in the year 2016-17 to about 2.8% in 2019-20 and the estimated overall industrial sector growth for the year 2019-20 was about 2.5% as compared to 6.9% growth in the year 2018-19. Further, the service sector is estimated to grow at 6.9% in the year 2019-20 as compared to 7.5% in the year 2018-19. So, in the context of this news article, try to remember the actual trends of GDP at a constant prices and also at market prices over the past 5 years or in the last decade. And these trends are important for your exam because we have a relevant uh, previous question based on the trends of GDP in the 2015 UPSC prelims exam. With this information, let us move on to the practice question session. 
Now let us take up this question which was asked in 2015 UPSC prelims with reference to Indian economy consider the following statements. The rate of growth of real gross domestic product has steadily increased in the last decade. The gross domestic product at market prices has steadily increased in the last decade. So, here the first statement is incorrect because real GDP is the GDP calculated at constant prices with respect to a base year which is 2011-12 and know that real GDP is fluctuating in the past decade. For example, owing to the 2008 global financial crisis, India's GDP was negatively affected. Now, the second statement says the gross domestic product at market prices has steadily increased in the last decade and this statement is correct because GDP at market prices is the nominal GDP that is the GDP based on current prices which includes impact of inflation. So, considering the impact of inflation the nominal GDP has been increasing steadily in the last decade. So, the correct answer for this question is option B 2 only. Let us take up these two questions based on monetary policy. So, this question was asked in 2015 UPSC prelims exam with reference to Indian economy consider the following bank rate, uh, open market operations, public debt, public revenue. For this question you need to choose uh, components of monetary policy. On the similar lines uh, let us take up this question with reference to Indian economy consider the following cash reserve ratio, moral suasion, margin requirements, reverse repo rate. To this question also you need to choose uh, components of quantitative credit control policy. So, in the context of these two questions know that uh, monetary policy refers to the use of uh, monetary instruments under the control of uh, RBI to regulate uh, interest rates, money supply and availability of credit to achieve the ultimate objective of sustainable economic growth. As per uh, monetary policy of RBI there are two methods of credit control one is known as quantitative or general credit control policy and the other is qualitative or selective credit control policy. So, these two are methods of monetary policy by the Reserve Bank of India. Know that under general credit control policy RBI uses bank rate, cash reserve ratio, statutory liquidity ratio, repo and reverse repo rates, then marginal standing facility and also open market operations. Then under qualitative credit control policy or selective credit control policy RBI may impose a ceiling on credit that is it will restrict the lending capacity of banks to grant loans against specific securities then it may impose margin requirements. Here know that a margin means the proportion of the value of security against which loan is not given. So, margin against a particular security is reduced in order to increase the credit flow to a particular sector and it is increased to decrease the credit flow. So, to understand this margin requirements let us take up one example say one person went to the bank with a collateral security of 100 crores and the bank may not give 100 percent value of a collateral security and it may extend 60 percent of value of security based on the policies of uh, the respective bank and the remaining 40 percent is known as margin which indicates the proportion of the value of security against which loan is not given. So, if margin is reduced that is from 40 to 30 percent then the borrower may get 70 percent of value of security and if the margin is increased from 40 percent to 50 percent the borrower may get 50 percent of value of security. So, we can say that uh, if margin against a particular security is reduced it may increase credit flow to a particular sector and if it is increased it decreases credit flow to the particular sector. Then the one more qualitative method is through discriminatory interest rates here RBA makes a credit flow to certain priority or weaker sectors by charging concessional rate of interest. Then uh, moral suasion is also part of qualitative credit control policy. As part of uh, moral suasion RBA issues periodical letters to banks to exercise uh, control over credit against particular commodities. So, we can say moral suasion, ceiling of credit and margin requirements come under qualitative credit control policy. So, with this information let us take up the given questions. The correct answer for this question is option C 1 and 2. And for this question you need to choose uh, components of quantitative credit control policy. So, cash reserve ratio and uh, reverse repo rate constitute part of quantitative credit control policy. So, the answer is option D 1 and 4. 
Consider the following pairs. Here pairs are given with reference to state of geographical indications like Pokkali rice with Tamil Nadu, Kala Namak rice Uttar Pradesh, Kaipad rice Kerala, Ambe Mohar rice Bihar, Basmati Punjab. Which of the given above is or or correctly matched? In the context of this question, try to know that the geographical indication is an indication used on products that have a specified geographical origin and having unique qualities and reputations because of the source of origin. So, J tag conveys an assurance of quality and distinctiveness and mainly used to identify agricultural or natural or manufactured goods. And you should know that geographical indication is given as per the provisions of geographical indications of goods registration and protection act of 1999. And this tag is valid for a period of 10 years and can be renewed from time to time for a further period of 10 years. And this question is with reference to rice varieties. So for your reference we have given important rice varieties which were awarded GI tag. So, Pokkali rice is from the state of Kerala, Kala Namak rice variety from the state of Uttar Pradesh, Kaipad rice variety from the state of Kerala, Ambe Mohar from the state of Maharashtra and Basmati rice J tag extends to the states of Punjab, Haryana, Himachal Pradesh, National Capital Territory, Uttarakhand, Uttar Pradesh and the erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir. So, in the given pairs, 1 and 4 are incorrectly matched and the remaining pairs are correctly matched. So, the correct answer for this question is option C, 2, 3 and 5 only. Now, let us take up this question which was asked in 2013 UPSC prelims exam. Priority sector lending by banks in India constitutes the lending to agriculture, micro and small enterprises weaker sections. In the context of this question try to know that there are 8 categories as per the priority sector lending program. These are agriculture, micro, small, medium enterprises, export credit, education, housing, social infrastructure, renewable energy and others category. So, the correct answer for this question is option D all of the above. Now, let us take up one more question on priority sector lending by banks in India. Which of the following categories of borrowers will be considered as weaker sections under the priority sector lending by banks in India? So, here options are minority communities, self-help groups, distressed farmers, indebted to non-institutional lenders, scheduled caste and scheduled tribes. So, as per the priority sector lending program of uh, Reserve Bank of India, weaker sections category include small and marginal farmers, artisans, village and cottage industries, then beneficiaries and the government uh, sponsored schemes like NRLM program, national urban livelihood missions, self-employment scheme for rehabilitation of manual scavengers, scheduled caste and scheduled tribes, beneficiaries of differential rate of interest scheme, self-help groups, then distressed farmers indebted to non-institutional lenders, then distressed persons other than farmers, then individual women beneficiaries up to 1 lakh per borrower, persons with disabilities, overdraft limit to PMJDY that is Pradhan Mantri Jandan Yojana, then minority communities as may be notified by government of India from time to time. So, the correct answer for this question is option D 1, 2, 3, 4. With this, we have come to the end of today's Hindu news analysis. If you like the video, please do like, share, comment and subscribe Shankar IS Academy YouTube channel for more updates.